In a few days' time, the Manda Scott interview for the Iron Podcast will be released, and I think it's a really good one. I think it's going to resonate with lots and lots of people. Manda definitely has a really powerful and exciting vision for the future, and a very interesting take also on how it's all going to come to life. Her methods for connecting to our potential and realizing our dreams, they make things really clear and quite simple. She's got a great way with her words. All of this made for a lovely chat, but more importantly, it was just fantastic listening for me. Amanda's big offering in my eyes is her four-step process for connecting to our true power, but I'm gonna let you have that all to yourselves on the Thursday episode. Right now, I'm gonna focus on a key theme that arose often during our conversation, and it remained enormously relevant throughout too, and that's patience. As a very intense and tense and erratic individual, especially when I was younger, I was told often by people to be patient, to calm down, to relax, to give it time and all these kind of things. And as I see it, the concept of being patient can either be incredibly limiting and a little bit damaging or actually boundlessly powerful and life affirming, depending upon the way that we interpret it. So I want to use this little episode now, I guess, to explore the power of patience in all aspects of life. And I want to look at it using two different perspectives that I like to call the genius and the grafter versions of ourselves. So for those of you who've had the misfortune to catch a few of these podcasts of mine, you may be somewhat familiar with my crazy obsession with this whole transformation that takes place within sports performers, somewhere between that team changing room or individual dressing room before kickoff or before the beginning of, of a match and then what happens on the match field just after that first whistle blows. Obviously, this is all out of my own experience, but I've also spent quite a lot of time discussing this with teammates and with people from other sports too. So stuck inside that enclosed space under the stands, immersed in that smell of sweat, deep heat, God knows what else, everyone's looking for that last minute morsel of peace or security or self-belief whatever we can find with just pretty much our stress and our fears as well for company that change room can be tense and anxious it can be a tough environment to say the least but then the game starts And then it's all pure clarity, simplicity, massive engagement, exploration, expression, all this beauty, the threats, the concerns, the pressure, the stress, all of that just dissolves away and the energy completely changes. This fascinates me how that can happen. The pre-match preparation state, well, that belongs to the grafter. That's how the grafter sees life. The grafter is a survivor. But the match player state, that's the genius version of who we are for me. The genius is a creator. And the genius's way of defining patience, therefore, is going to be so different to the grafters. So looking at that, I think sporting geniuses are immense to watch when they're on their stage. It's just beautiful. They're so majestic. They're so graceful. They just seem to own the pitch, the court, the track the Oki, whatever their arena may be. They seem to have so much time on the ball. They seem so relaxed, so ready, but it's also effortless, so flowing. In other words, geniuses play with this kind of confidence. It's like they know something that we don't when they're in that state, when they're in their their environment. They may have to move fast at times, but they never seem to be rushing. They may display emotion, but they never lose that calm or composure they exhibit for me a glorious kind of patience and this patience relates to the inner state of being these geniuses are readying themselves for something special to take place but this something special is not an outcome or an event it's the expression of their gift it's a connection that they're after and they're aware that this phenomenal opportunity can be at any time So in order to ensure that they are, I guess, open to it and ready, they tune into this moment now by cultivating all the right conditions within themselves and leave them just bubbling under the surface. There's not this concept 
that a later moment is going to be more important than this one or that this moment is not as it should be. So therefore, there's no getting angry, no fighting with what is. There's no reacting. There's no asking, oh, when will it happen for me? Why does it never work out for me? This impatience. There's no blaming everyone and everything else for that discrepancy between what they're getting and what they're expecting. The geniuses accept what's happening in this moment and that allows their attention, their passion and their intent to engage fully in the vision for the next moment. They're purposefully driven all the time in this way, ridiculously present and unbeatably effective too in every moment. There's no laziness, there's never disinterest, but there is, however, a mean efficiency of energy. So for me, the way of the genius is the way of no wasted energy. No wasted energy in things like regret or in judgment of others, because all their energy stems from this complete trust that their big moment is coming. It's coming. It's coming. Stay in the game. Just stay in the game. I can hear my most wonderful friend Steve Black's voice in my ear now. He used to say this all the time, before the game, during the game, after the game, midweek, end of week, start of week. Just stay in the game. And this is for me what self-worth feels like. This is the core of the genius's genius. The understanding that the next moment holds everything. The understanding that we only ever take one step in life and it's the next one. And when we devote ourselves fully to that next step, we may be surprised where it can take us and how it can change worlds. Patience is how we best embody that next step. Patience is that full involvement in it. So this patience, it's not about sitting out of this now moment, waving it past, waiting for a, a future better one. Because that's living by accident. In that changing room survival state as the grafter, I remember those final 10 minutes. Whether it was for my junior club, age four, five, six, whether it was for my school a bit later on, whether it was for England, whether it was for the Lions, or even I remember quite vividly being so anxious and stressful before playing a game of friendly sevens um, for Newcastle Falcons professional team against a set of teachers from a local secondary school with all the pupils out on the sidelines watching I see now this overwhelming sense of dramatic urgency underneath everything a kind of panic a total outsourcing of that internal environment it's just total reactivity I remember fretting praying hoping feeling anything but patient or whole the core of the grafter therefore is not trust but doubt but on the field, though, just like in that bizarre sevens tournament, I find my ability to respond. I find my genius and it's like coming home. It suddenly all makes sense. The big problem, though, is that the grafter in me started to take credit for that shift, for the shift between the changing room to the pitch. The grafter wanted to say, this is down to my suffering, to my sacrifice. It's because I got so tense and lost in my mind that's what opened the door for the genius in me to come out. And this understanding settled deep in me and it ultimately determined a large part of my life and constructed huge, huge limits for me. We've had a lot of this come up several times in the podcast, but I want to sort of revisit it now because it's kind of heading home, I think. Our ability to respond right here in this present moment to whatever we're experiencing is our potential. Growth and a shift towards our true power, that to me feels like it's made up of spontaneity, intuition, insights, impulses and inspiration. And none of these things we own or have any control over. We cannot plan for any of these things because well, I guess any idea of what they should be or might be, well, that comes from the past, which leads us away from the now and sends us back into our mind for things like comparison, competition, self-critiquing. These old ideas, there are limits. They come from the known, not from the unknown. 
But the unknown source of intelligence that holds all our potential, it comes through us, it isn't ours. Whatever we've done or felt in the past, we don't own the formula. I mean, you just have to try, I guess, to replicate an old feeling, uh, a great day we had in the past, or a brilliant friendship from before, and then see for yourself what happens. Because yesterday's effortless inspiration, when you try and match it, is just today's uninspired trying and struggle. Old exploration becomes new controlling. It seems to me like a cruel trick that we fall for every time because we just like to think that we were responsible, we did it, that we own it, somehow it's down to us. Maybe it's just, I guess, feels more secure that more way, maybe more safe, more we get more closure for it. Again, these things have come up already in the Iron podcast. But this, for me, it's the difference between the younger versions of ourselves and the older versions. Because as young kids, we are large part geniuses, full of life, vibrancy, always creating, always inspiring, but with no desire to lay claim to the universe's offerings. We're so open to whatever consequences arise because I think we're more secure in our capacity to handle them. What, I guess, would our younger versions say now if they were to look at us? What would they be thinking? Would they be thinking, what have we done with all this time to grow and expand upon that joy and happiness we experienced all those years ago? With all this opportunity, what have we done with it? For potential to be real, it needs to be surrendered to. So anticipation, that's powerful, as is curiosity, as is the reverence for the uncontrollable and that zest for the unpredictability of life. All these things make up patience. So does that immense humility that comes with the awareness of our insignificance and of our impermanence. Whatever we hold on to is only going to hold us back. So any kind of condition or insistence upon certain outcomes, and boy was I full of those, those only serve to remove our ability to respond and create it removes our ability for patience and drops us back into that reactivity. Any conclusion that we've concreted in about how this moment needs to be, it just coerces us into fighting to manipulate and force things. Our effortless flow in that way, I guess, disappears along with our genius. We can never live up to expectations, I guess. We can only live down to them. In the now, the way I see it, we're always equipped. The genius version of ourselves always has it covered. But we just can't know ahead of time exactly how he or she is going to respond. So we have to be, I guess, really interested, but completely allowing. Again, this for me is patience. When I think about it, has anything that we've encountered in our now been too much for us to handle? Has it ever been too much for me? The answer, if you're listening to this podcast and me, I'm doing it, means that we're alive here and now. So the answer is no. Even when you feel like you cannot accept something, you already have accepted it. It's already been accepted on every level by life itself because it's happening. It's just the grafter in us that wants to fight that valiant fight against what is to receive some kind of plaudit, some sort of ownership, some sort of, I don't know, understanding. But it's the genius in us all, I think, that's doing the looking after us. Patience for me, then, is when we see that we're perfect as we are now and that we are exactly where we're supposed to be at this moment, that this moment in its own way is inevitable. This is a kind of gratitude, I think, a deep gratitude, a gratitude that can really blossom and it's a phenomenal ingredient of patience. Through this acceptance and this gratitude, this fascination and openness with life, we fall into alignment with everything that's going on around us and everything that is. We hear it all the time about sports people on that stage. Oh, she watched that one right onto the racket. He played that one so late. He must have read his opponent's mind. Oh, she makes it look so easy. How often do we hear this talk of the timing or the incredible vision of the genius or the, their touch and their feel and their extrasensory kind of abilities? 
How often do we stand flabbergasted by the sheer lack of effort that seems to go in, but the immense output? It's incredible. But this is not about carefully finding that right moment. It's not a mind or mental based thing. It's the same way that finding the now and living in the now doesn't mean carefully selecting or or judging that space between the past and the future. The same way that you cannot think your way into good dancing. You just let go and it's there. The zone of performance, of patience, of confidence is just sports people surrendering to the music of the situation and letting go so that their intelligence, their soul, their gift can connect and find the next step in the choreography. In the zone, I know from my own experience, I never wanted to decide what the music was. I didn't want to change the way things were. I didn't want to know what the next step was going to be in the dance before it happened. I just knew it needed to be allowed. And in doing so, I found myself constantly surprised by my innate ability, not just to handle things, but to create and co-create amazing, amazing experiences. The path was incredible and is incredible through those eyes. Problem for me was though, as the grafter, I did the same dance every weekend in that change room because I had the same music playing inside my head all the time. And I chose that rather than to listen in more subtly to that ever evolving situation around me and to the constant changes taking place in me as well with my passion screaming out. I ignored all that. Sure, I tried to be patient, but the trying was what made sure, absolutely sure, that I was doing everything but being patient. My shoulders raised, my head hunched over, my eyes down, tension everywhere. And if we look in the streets of this world, I think we see the same posture of the absence of rush, of wasted energy and limited awareness. We're all consumed by our minds rather than listening to the sounds of this very moment, rather than opening up to that dance. And as a way, I guess we get lost in the same routine, the same dance that just seems more and more awkward and out of step as we go along. For the grafter then, for me, when I was in that state, the idea of patience when it was suggested to me just felt awful. I think this is because through the grafter's eyes, which is all about meeting expectations, it's about conclusions of right and wrong and good and bad, it's about that perfectionism, I guess, that I had in me, that survival mechanism. For the grafter, therefore, I think there's a compulsion to constantly be doing something to change the way things are, to fit old ideas. And so therefore, patience for the grafter, for me when I was like that, it means inactivity. And when you're not able to do, when everything's about doing, that's unbearable. For me, it was hell. It was like helplessness. It was like letting open the floodgates to all the doom. It was giving up survival. And it was torture. So I tried to be patient, but what I did was I just waited. I waited in pain. I suffered the time and it passed so, so slowly. So for me, practicing patience, practicing trust, gratitude, that's essentially the entire ball game right there. It's worth exploring in every moment. It doesn't mean not having a go or not being impulsive. It just means looking after that internal situation, that internal environment before looking anywhere else. Because no one can take away how we want to be on the inside. The spaciousness, the calm, the awareness, the aliveness. People and things, yes, they can stop us from doing what we want sometimes, a lot of the time. Doing, yeah, doing what we want to do, I guess. But they cannot stop us from being who we are. Patience for me and for the genius, I think, it means following the highest excitement we have in this moment. Whatever we can do that seems most interesting to us right now, that's important. It's not about bowing out of life, but it's about diving in deeper. Whatever we have to do, can we be how we want to be whilst we do it? And can we do it, therefore, in the most beautiful way possible? Patience for me represents that depth of our presence in this moment through excitement, passion, and through our engagement. 
I'm starting to realize that nothing for me is worth being pulled out of that creative, aware source of patience. This source holds everything we'll ever need and more, an ever-expanding array of possibilities that life's challenges I feel are in some way deftly designed to intelligently guide us through. As the guru uh, Ravi Shankar said on the subject of the law of attraction, it's simple. Once you stop craving it, it'll come. Good things come to those that wait. I'm not entirely sure about that statement. I kind of think the genius in me prefers the idea that great things come through patience. And in fact, patience itself might be one of the greatest things there is. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks very much for being part of these podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. And thanks for your energy. It's uh, it's really cool. Obviously, I'm going off on my own little tangent on these Tuesdays a little bit, listening to your questions, listening to what's coming in and trying to look at things through the eyes and the lens that I'm wearing right now in terms of my journey. And I hope it's resonating in some way with you, but I'd love to hear from you. So please let me know whatever's important to you right now. If there's things you want to explore uh, with me, if there's guests you want us to approach, we've got some great ones coming up and I really hope you enjoy Thursday's episode with Amanda Scott. It's definitely worth tuning in for and, and one that's had a huge impact upon me. Thanks again. My name is Johnny Wilkinson. This is the I Am Podcast with Manda Scott. So that's it for another episode of I Am. It's brilliant to be sharing this unfolding experience with you all. If you'd like to get in touch with either me or the guest, then all the information you need is in the show notes. I welcome all and any feedback. I really want all of you to have a hand in guiding the feel of this show and the path of the conversation as well. So just keep them coming in. And until next time, I'm Johnny Wilkinson, and this has been I Am. This show is brought to you by Max Creative. The executive producer is Megan Hill-Smith. Assistant producer is Alex Macy.